Oh, there we are. Thank you, Taylor. <laughs> I, um, good morning, afternoon, wherever we are. It's good to be with you all. Um, I was joking in the first service. It's the first time that I've used this new beautiful pulpit, and it's a little taller. So I first opened up my laptop, and I was like, oh, I can barely see over all of you, (laughs) over this to all of you. Um, So anyway, it's good to be with you. Justin asked me to uh, speak today, and um, as I was asking the Lord, what do you want to speak about? What do you have to say to us on Sunday? I instantly saw the word worship in front of me, and um, I actually kind of dismissed it at first, thinking it was just my own thought. I don't really pay a whole lot of attention or heed it. And so I continued about my day, and I was going for a walk, and I was like, Lord, what do you want to say um, on Sunday? And it was just completely quiet. (laughs) And I immediately went back to, oh, that was you speaking. You want to talk about worship. So let me open us up in prayer before we open the word. Father, thank you. Thank you for this family of people gathered here. Thank you for your presence. I thank you that you pursue us and that you want to be with us. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your truth. I thank you that you are the bread of life. Father, I ask that as we open your word today, that you would pour out deeper revelation of what you want to say in regards to worship. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We say, have your way. And move in our midst. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. If you've um, been in the church for any length of time, you may have heard a sermon or two about worship. I'd like to invite you, though, today um, to be willing to listen to it with new ears. The Lord designed worship, and he knows so much more about it. There are so many more layers than I think that we even are aware of. And so I want to invite him to, and my prayer is that he would just open up a new layer, a new realm, go deeper maybe something that you haven't heard in regards to worship or maybe even experienced. Um, I've mentioned before when I've shared, um, there's a gentleman that I really like his resources. He does um, an extensive study on the original languages, uh, the Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic that the Bible was written in. And so when I want to dive deep into a particular topic or word, I like to go to his resources. His name is Chaim Bintora. Um, So when the Lord gave me the word worship, um, I immediately went to um, his resources. And he actually starts out um, talking about worship in the book of Judges, which is in the Old Testament. If you want to go ahead and turn there with me, we'll be in Judges chapter 7. And we'll start in verse 9, just a little bit of a backstory. This um, has to do with Gideon. If you're not familiar with who Gideon is, uh, Gideon was chosen by God to lead Israel into a battle against uh, the Midianites and the Amalekites. Um, Gideon, though, is um, the unassumed person because he tells the Lord that he was... um, the least in his family, and his family was the least um, in the tribe. So when the Lord came to him, he was hiding in the wine press, if you're not familiar with the story, and the Lord came to him and called him out and said, man of mighty valor, I've chosen you to lead my people into war, into battle uh, for freedom. So um, the Lord had to, in that moment, undo Gideon's identity, because Gideon told God who he is, and God had to tell Gideon who he actually was. So that was part of his process in raising Gideon up. 
Um, so we'll jump down to verse 9. The, the war is imminent. And the Lord says to Gideon, that same night the Lord said to him, Arise, go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Purah, your servant. And you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Purah, his servant, to the outpost of the armed men who were in the camp. And the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the people of the east lay along the valley like locusts in abundance, and their camels were without number, as the sand is on the seashore in abundance. When Gideon came... Behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it so that it fell and turned it upside down so that the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has given into his hand Midian in all the camp. As soon as Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped. And he returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has given the host of Midian into your hand. What I think is interesting about this um, passage that we read is the Lord comes to Gideon and he knows that war is and then it's coming and he says, Hey, Gideon. First of all, backstory, Gideon had uh, gotten some, several men, the Lord told him to get an army together, and he had around 33,000 men show up over the process of weeding them out. He's down to 300 men to fight with him. 33,000 to 300. We can just about fit 300 people in this room, if that gives you an idea of what he was fighting with. He goes to the camp. And he tells Gideon, hey, Gideon, I want you to do something. I want you to go into the enemy's camp, just in the outpost. And I want you to hear what they're saying. When you hear what they're saying, your hand will be strengthened to win this war. The Bible tells us that the men of Midian and the Amalekites were vastly numbered that even the camels were that of the sand of the sea. Has anyone ever been to the beach? Have you seen the sand? Can you count the sand? Can you imagine going in knowing this is your enemy's camp and even their camels are that of the sand of the sea? That could be pretty intimidating. But God sends them there. Of all the people that Gideon could have been around at that time, he was around the man that God gave a dream to. Of all the people that Gideon could have been around at that time, he was around the man who had the interpretation of the dream. The timing and the placement was divine for a purpose, so that Gideon's hand would be strengthened to go into battle. He had to walk at the exact location where the man who had the dream was also going to be within earshot. And God allowed Gideon to hear this dream and the interpretation. What I think is interesting is the Lord gave the enemies people the dream and the interpretation. He could have sent a prophet to Gideon and said, the Lord told me. The Lord gave me this vision. The Lord gave me this dream. So I think there's a double effect here, in my opinion. For the enemy to have had this dream and to interpret it and say that is none other than Gideon, the son of Joash. They knew who he was. The Lord has surely given Midian into his hand. That causes defeat in the heart of an enemy. The Lord has given, we're we're already done. 
The Lord's already given it into his hand. Not only does it cause defeat, but it causes encouragement in Gideon's heart. As soon as Gideon heard it, he worshipped. I'd like to talk about what worship is. A lot of times in the church, we imagine and associate singing and dancing and praising and lifting our hands and speaking and uh, preaching the word as worship. If Gideon had done any of those things, he would have immediately been exposed. So Haim looks into further, what does the word worship mean here? What is it that Gideon did when he worshiped? So it's a Hebrew word um, that's used, and I'm going to try really hard to pronounce it. Um, but it is uh, a little challenging. Um, Yesheta, probably butchered that, but um, it comes from a root word, shaka. And there's a Semitic root here, meaning to swim or to be surrounded by water. In other words, it's being surrounded by the presence of God. If you've ever been surrounded by the presence of God, you know that you experience his holiness, which is the word Kadesh, and that has the idea of weightiness. Have you ever been in his presence? It's just heavy, and all you can do is to bow, to lower yourself, to kneel, to lay prostrate before him. His holy presence surrounds you and saturates you. That's what Gideon experienced. The very God that sent him down there went with him, surrounding him, dancing over him in his presence. The Lord found Gideon hiding when he first found him in the wine, in the wine press. And so I think it's interesting in this verse, he's like, hey, Gideon, I want you to go down to the camp. If you're afraid, you can take Pura. And who did he take? He took Pura with him. He's like, I need to get you to this point where your hand is strengthened. And I already know what's going on inside of you. And if you need the crutch to get there, I can, over, I can overcome that. I can work with that. He's not asking us to be perfect and to have it all together for him to be able to use us. If we have to come with the crutch, we can come with the crutch until he works through us and in us to cleanse and to place our, our true identity and work that into us. No one is disqualified just because you have a crutch. Need a support system? I can work with that. You're not disqualified. Another thing about worship that I've seen in the church, but also personally believed at one point, it seems to me that you still see a lot of people struggle with the idea that the Lord would sing over you. Like, he is a holy God. He is magnificent. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is righteous. He is our Savior. That He is pure. There is no fault found in him. So I don't want to take away from the reverential awe of who he is. All of that is true. But worship includes intimacy. And intimacy is a two-way street. When we say, Lord, I worship you. I give you everything. You are holy. You are worthy. I love you. I lay down my life to serve you. But we can't, when he wants to sing over us, say, no, I'm not worthy. No, I can't receive that. Then we're preventing him from being able to 
love on us and join us in that intimate relationship with us. I can have an intimate relationship with any friend here and I can be vulnerable and pour out my heart. But if that's not reciprocated, then it's just a one-way street. As I was thinking about this, um, I had, I feel like the Holy Spirit gave me an illustration that I'm going to share with you. Um, my mom is here. I'm gonna, I already gave her a heads up, and she agreed to join me in this illustration. Okay, so go here with me for a second. When we view God as our Father and holy, and He's an authority, and we can offer Him worship and praise and adoration, but we don't receive that from Him. We don't receive the intimacy from Him. It would be no different than um, than if I had that type of relationship with my mom. So my mom, let me back up a little bit. Jesus paid it all, right? He he finished the work. He owes us nothing, right? So we could say, you've done it all, and you don't owe me anything. My mom carried me in her womb. She, she gave birth to me and brought me into this earth. She cared for me and raised me. So as I grow up, and I'm an adult, and I can be on my own, I could say, you don't owe me anything at all. In fact, I can't even hear you speak to me because I'm unworthy. I need to be the one bringing you everything. I don't even expect you to want to be with me because I'm unworthy. You've done everything. But I will come before you because I owe you everything. And I want that type of a relationship with you. How many would say that that's a healthy relationship? Could our relationship continue to thrive if that was the way that she viewed her position and I viewed mine? But yet we put God in that box when we view worship one way. I have a son sitting right up there. If he were to come down here to be with me, to tell me something, I wouldn't even wait for him to get all the way here before I went running to grab him, to pull him up in my arms and give him a hug. And that is how God sees us. You are his child. You are not a burden. My children are not a burden. I love being with my kids. I love spending time with them. I love having conversation. I love when they want to come pour out their heart to me and talk to me and tell me what their day is or tell me a silly story. I love watching them enjoy what they're doing and that is how God views us. Thank you. Can you see how God views us there? God views us as the father that wants to spend time with his kids and I was thinking about it today. That must really frustrate the spirit of religion. The spirit of religion says you have to work for it. You have to check all the boxes. Chaim goes on to say um, about this word. Let me grab a drink. Um, Heim goes on to say, be that as it may, there is one thing I have discovered about the word worship as I continue to research it out. There is nothing that implies music, singing, dancing, praying, repeating the name of Jesus over and over. Nothing to do with reading the scriptures. Nothing to do with listening to a sermon. Being in a church or even speaking. Catch this part. 
In fact, I am beginning to realize that worship is a lot more of allowing God to have his own way with us as we just sit back, kneel, fall prostrate, or just stand with arms lifted, letting him surround us with his presence and love. Worship is allowing God to feel pleasure in being with us. Have you ever thought of worship that way? Have you ever thought about the fact that God feels pleasure just being with you? Coming together corporately and having a time of praise and singing is amazing. And we have an amazing praise and worship team every Sunday that leads us right into the presence of God. And it's a good thing to do that. It's a good thing to come together and experience his presence corporately. But this type of presence, this type of worship, we can experience out there in our everyday lives. In fact, as we grow in our relationship with him, then this time becomes more strengthened. As we grow and mature, as we've spent that time with him, then this time becomes more strengthened. We all have a part to bring as we gather corporately. We all have something to offer. God's given each one of you a gift. And he just delights in the gift that he gives you. Haim was mentioning um, the... This is the part that I think really ticks off the religious spirit. Um, And he said that he met a priest who was very skilled in woodworking. And he says he worships God. Um, Let's see. He says he worships God or feels God's pleasure as he works with wood. And then he mentions Eric Liddell. He won the gold medal in the 1926 Olympics and who was also portrayed in the movie um, Chariots of Fire. And Eric said, God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. The thing I love about those two examples, woodworking and running, is there is no benefit for the person around them. It is unfortunate that I personally don't benefit when Eric runs. If he could run and I would benefit, that would be amazing. (laughs) But it's just something pleasurable to him. It's that simple. Something that he does to earn it, to work for it. He's not checking off boxes. He's just doing something. He's using a gift God's given him. He's finding pleasure in it because he knows that the Father is finding pleasure in him using that gift. How many have felt guilty when you have gone through the week and you realize, ah, I only had quiet time two times this week. Ah, I fell asleep reading. I was reading the word, I fell asleep. Uh, I don't even know how to have quiet time with him. I don't know what to do, how to hear him. Uh, I was praying and I fell asleep. Can we just remove that guilt and that shame? Just you showing up, letting your father have pleasure in being with you was enough. We can shut down the religious spirit by not checking boxes, but just being. We often see in worship, and I think it's reasonable because we have kind of created this umbrella and said, you know, we, we raise our hands or we clap or we sing, we dance before the Lord and that's our, our worship. I would propose to you that's a, actually a response right. to him. Yes. 
Everyone here has a story. Everyone has an experience. I love to watch people worship because it tells a story. When they're dancing before the Lord, they've had an experience with him. When they're moved to tears, when they're clapping, raising their hands, whatever it may be, as a response to his goodness and what he's done in their lives. But we can't know those experiences because I can't know, know him because you've experienced him. You hear people give the illustration of, um, I'm going to use chocolate chip cookies. If I came to you and I was like, there's this place down the road that has amazing chocolate chip cookies. It's brand new. You've never been there, but I've been there. And they are um, fresh out of the oven when you order them. They don't even hand them to you until they're fresh out of the oven. And they're gooey in the center. They're warm. They're kind of crunchy on the outside when you pull them apart. The chocolate just drips. And they are phenomenal. Well, I can speak to you from that and tell you exactly what, it, what it's like because I've experienced it. And hopefully me speaking about my experience creates in you a desire to have the same experience. When we speak about our experiences in our relationship with God, in our worship, it creates in the people around us to have those same experiences. I need to know that this God that you're talking about that pulled you out of the pit, I need to know him for myself. I need to know this God that you're talking about that healed you, that provided for you when there was no way can provide for me too. I need to know that this God that fills you with hope in a world that seems hopeless can fill me with hope too. These stories matter out there in our everyday life. There's a place for corporate. There's a place for corporate worship, but everyday life is where the people are that need to hear this. I need to hear this. I need to be able to feel his presence and let him just take pleasure in being with us. We sing about it in so many songs today. It's when you, for me, when, after having kind of done a study and a deep dive into this word worship, I hear songs differently. We probably should have like maybe done the, the sermon first and then enter into worship. <laughs> into a time of song and praise. So you could feel the Father taking pleasure in you. I realize that not everybody came from a home where your parents took pleasure in you. And that can provide a challenge to understand what it's like to have a heavenly father who takes pleasure in us. Maybe you never experienced your father wrapping you up in his arms and swinging you around so delighted with a smile from ear to ear just because you were there. I have good news for you. You've been adopted into a new family and your heavenly father wants to show you that kind of love. None of us grow up in a perfect family. We all do the best we can with what we know. But he meets us there. Whatever we didn't get in our family in our household, he can, he can provide for us. He can get to us. He's a good father. Yes. And he delights in you. He just loves to be with you. Um, I would actually like 
to give an invitation. See, I don't want you to walk out of these doors the same way that you came. And I know we say that a lot, and that can become a little cliche in the church. But I worship a God who changes lives. And when we gather, our lives should be changed here. When any time you encounter his presence, it should change your life. So if there is a part that's broken or wounded or confused, he wants to touch that part and see you mended and healed and have clarity. So I want to move and make space for the Holy Spirit to come in, for your Father God to come in and to allow you to feel his pleasure over you. Do you mind playing for me? Thank you. And I want to invite the prayer team to go ahead and come up if you would, please. As Wayne plays, um, I just want you to, if you, if you didn't come from a family that you felt loved and you don't know what that looks like and you've never had an opportunity to experience it, you're invited to come and let one of these people pray for you, for you to experience the Father's great pleasure and his great love for you. If you have only understood worship in the box of religion, you haven't had the freedom to just live in his presence and know what it feels like to have him take pleasure in you, I invite you to come forward and allow the Lord to undo the thinking, the wrong thinking, the wrong understanding, and instill in us a deeper revelation of what worship actually is to experience him not just hear about him, not just talk about him, not just sing the song, not just lift your hands. Truly be changed by experiencing his presence. Gideon, in experiencing God's presence, was strengthened for war. He was given boldness. He was strengthened with courage. in his presence that we're equipped. What is before you today? Do you have something before you today that you're standing for, that God's leading you to, that you feel unqualified for? Get in his presence and let him lavish his love on you just as the natural rain is saturating the earth right now, let his presence saturate you. So I invite you to come forward if that's any of you. I'm going to pray over us corporately as these people boldly come forward wanting more of what he has to offer. Father, we thank you for the natural rain. We ask for your spirit to saturate our lives. Saturate us now. Thank you for pursuing us and taking great pleasure in who you've called and created us to be. Wanting to be with us. Longing to be near us. Longing for us to have a deeper revelation of what it means to have a relationship with you showing us another aspect of who you are, Father. Thank you. 
Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.